I want to say a special word of welcome to those people who are watching on the internet. I was told this weekend that we have several people who tune in and watch the sermons afterwards, so a big shout out to you. So, and thank you for letting me know that you do that. Today, I, I want to let you know that I really like maps, okay? I, I like to be able to see a plan. I like to know how to get from here to there. So I have been really, really, really grateful for my GPS since I came here, okay? You know, GPS, it stands for Global Positioning System. That means if you're anywhere in the world and you're connected to a GPS, you can find your way around. So I have gotten the hang of the, of the big roads, okay? And I can tell you when, as I'm driving which dairy farm is coming up and which, which ones are Holsteins and which ones are Jerseys and which ones are those belted Galloways, the, the Oreo cows, right? And those beautiful herds of black Angus. There were a lot of calves this year in the, in the farm out by where I am. There were a lot of calves, they're so cute. But I'm still working on the less traveled roads, especially when I'm not going the way that I normally go on Sunday morning, so that I can get navigate that path forward. But if I have to go the other way, it's it's a challenge. And one morning, I, well, one well, one time, I found myself traveling from Westby back out to Faith. And I was on Bloomingdale Road, and it was just wrong. I mean, I, I was lost. I, couldn't, I didn't have the right markers. I didn't see. I was sure I was on the wrong road. And so I pulled over to check my GPS. And I'm studying, and you know how you have that feeling that somebody's watching you, you know? And I looked up, and there were three faces right there at the window, okay? I had pulled in next to a grazing pasture for Jersey cows, and these three cows had mo <laughs> moseyed on up, and they were right there, okay? I mean, apparently I was, the, the road, the fence, and the cow, right there, okay? So, you know, I did what anybody would do. I rolled down the window and introduced myself and apologized <laughs> for the intrusion. And I asked them for help in my directions, and, and they assured me that I was on the right path, I should move. <laughs> of course, I had to do that. Um, but, and then they were laughing at me as I drove off. <laughs> Even a person who doesn't like to stop to ask for directions, we, like to, we have plans in our life. We, we, we have a system for doing things. We put the toothpaste on the toothbrush before we put it in our mouth. When we're going to the store, we get in the car, we turn on the ignition, we drive to the store, and then we shop for whatever we're hungry for because we left the shopping list on the counter back home, right? I have always assumed that what Paul was writing about in all of these letters to the churches were, were topics that he chose because of some issue that was going on in the church of that day. But when you study the whole body of Paul's works, he, he talks about the same topics to almost every church. And it's interesting because those are topics that are just still so important for us today. They're, so I'm thinking that he talked about human traits that we're always going to wrestle with. Now remember as a recap, these first three chapters of Ephesians, they talk about our blessings. And last week we looked at how we truly thank God when we live a life of praise that uses our spiritual gifts to uplift someone else. And in our text today, Paul gives the people at Ephesus some very straightforward language about a plan for living. So today Paul is telling us, hey, we've all got emotions. And we experience at times, all of us do, negative emotions. And we need to get rid of those feelings of bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and malice and blah, 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 blah. They're all marks of unhealthy communication. But come on, Paul. I mean, what about the times that somebody's really mean? What about the times that their words and their actions and their inconsiderate behavior? I mean, it's really hurtful. I want to strike back. Now, I don't mean I want to hit somebody, necessarily. But I turned the other cheek, and, and they took advantage of my kindness. And, and when I turned the other cheek, they took advantage of me again. 
They were insulting and they embarrassed me and I'm going to show them I'm going to stop being a nice person. They were selfish, so I'm going to be selfish right back. Hmm. It's not very aligned with our seeing the Spirit of God in each face and building up each other in humility and gentleness and patience, is it? But it's a real response to how we feel. And sure, sure, it's easy to say, get rid of that bitterness and wrath. And yes, I want to let go of those feelings. Because we know when we hang on to that animosity and, and, and that anger against someone else, what does that anger really do? Who does it end up destroying? Of course, we're the ones who are burdened and challenged and ultimately taken apart by those negative feelings. But anger can be a reasonable emotion, too. You know, it's sometimes helpful to help us make sense of a situation if... If we recognize our anger and our part in the anger, and if we recognize what has caused our anger, and if we manage the way we respond. Now, I'm not going to say if we control our feelings, because that means that we want to bury things and cover them up. And I sure don't mean that. But recognize that there are triggers, and consider what is our best response. Is it stomping out and slamming a door or firing off a pithy email or a letter? There's a whole list of unflattering and unproductive ways to respond. It, those are the ways that the devil gets a foothold for us. Right here. Have you ever heard that sarcastic line, don't, uh, don't let the sun go down on your anger, stay up and fight, right? It's not really what Paul is saying here. We know forgiveness is central to our understanding of Christianity. The single most important theme in Christ's teaching and life is forgiveness. Christ endured all of that for our forgiveness and so that we can forgive others. And so yes, forgiveness is essential and critical. Being in right relations with one another, listening speaking truth to one another and giving grace to those who hear, or in Wesleyan terms, our words of truth must be a means of grace. That means we speak what is useful for building up another person. Working through bitterness, now that it's, it is, it's work. There's a great deal of healing and movement toward forgiveness that can happen when we pause and acknowledge that we are in conflict with someone, and then allowing a measure of time to give us perspective to our response. Cooling off, we call that. Thinking about what we might say or do and how our response can be helpful. Paul, you test me. You test me. Because then what does he say? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. All those characteristics nurture community and communion, and not, not the communion table, but our oneness and our togetherness with each other and with Christ. Kindness, compassion, forgiveness, all those are marks of healthy communication. So here we've been given a map. We've even been given friendly cows to point us on our way. This is our map for our new self, our living in love. And this is what Paul is lifting up here. It's not about the law, the natural, moral, or otherwise. This is a map about building up community. And that brings us to this powerful conclusion to this passage. And the imperative that we are imitators of God as beloved children living in love. Now the New International Version translation that Cindy read, that doesn't have that word imitators in it. So I want to share with you a few other translations just so you get the sense of how this was, was interpreted. Therefore, from the Common English translation, therefore, imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love following the example of Christ. I like this one from the Good News Translation. Since you are God's dear children, you must try to be like Him. 
or from the Living Bible, follow God's example in everything you do, just as a much-loved child imitates his father. That's what that picture of, of well, on, on the other bulletin we had, but just like that, the picture of the hand, the two hands together. A small hand imitating the larger hand. And if none of those make sense, hear these words from the message. Watch what God does and then do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Most of what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. Love like that. Forgive like that. Be kind like that. Wow, that's a tall order, Paul. It's common in Scripture for us to be told to imitate Christ, but to imitate God? That's a rare finding. Because we can't truly understand the nature of God. So Paul, how can we understand and how can we imitate what we don't understand? So to imitate God, we have to imitate the whole Trinity. And loving relationship and, and existence right here in our faith community and also in our extended community. That means Father Creator who forgives in order to restore right relationships. It means Christ the Redeemer by whom we are forgiven. And it means the Spirit Sustainer from whom we get our strength. Imitating the triune God. This is just really a restatement of the great commandment, isn't it? Love one another. As children of God, our love is not simply to be directed to God, but as imitators of God, our love is to be directed to others. Even more clearly, we can understand. Forgive as God has forgiven and be gracious as God has been gracious to you. Remember that Paul's letter was written to people who already claimed to be Christians. More importantly, it was two different factions, the Jews and the Gentiles, and even though they have very different views, they have been united in one body. So here's our map our model to imitate. If the church, and that's us as individuals as well as a collected people, if the church is to be the dwelling place of God, that's in us. Both Christ and the Spirit are in us. And we are created in Christ Jesus and created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And really, Really imitating God and living in love as Christ did, that can and that should just follow naturally. Yes, the command to imitate God is ambitious. It reminds us of the amazing possibilities ahead for this church. Are there amazing possibilities ahead for this church? Amen. Yes, there are. Are there amazing possibilities ahead for this church? Yes. 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 We're not alone in this or in any human challenge. God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Invite our ushers to receive our gifts, our tithes.